Please rise for the Gospel reading. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 6th chapter. Jesus said, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor about your body, what you shall put on. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add one cubit to the span of his life? Why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O men of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be yours as well. The Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious God, your word reminds us of your history of giving of your abundant love outpoured upon your creation every day since you said, let there be light. Lord, as we gather together once again as your people around word and sacrament, we offer up what is meet and right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks. From a gracious and joy-filled heart. And we offer these thanksgivings in the name of our dearest Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. So Sarah, I guess, is uh, becoming a little bit more curious about what it is that Dad does in preparations for sermons. So she was kind of hanging out over my shoulder. As I did uh, a quick little word search, I have this wonderful tool, and and I'm going to give thanks where thanks is due, saying this is Thanksgiving. Uh, That was a gift almost a decade ago now, as I stopped and thought, well, it was more than a decade ago. Um, eh, 2004, so I guess it would be 11 years ago. Pastor Mefford, a previous pastor of this congregation, as, uh, as I was preparing to go off to seminary for summer Greek, she gave me the gift of... This, uh, this thing called Bible Works, and I, there hasn't been a day since then. I probably haven't opened it up at least once. It's a really cool program, and uh, it's, like, it's like any concordance you might ever think of on steroids, right? So I, I, was, I, thought, you know, I asked myself, how many times does the word thanks, or one of its derivatives, thanks, thankful, thank, you know, thankfulness, those kind of things, how many times do you think that appears in scripture. Let's take a guess, wild guess. A thousand? That, yeah. Actually, you know what? You're, you're a little high there, oddly enough. A thousand is a little high. 214. And as Sarah was looking over my shoulder, she said, wow, dad, that word appears in the Bible an awful lot. And I said, yes, yes, it does. And a couple of them from the Old Testament really kind of struck a chord with me. And they were from uh, First Chronicles of all places. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon His name. Make His His deeds known among the peoples. And then 1 Corinthians 16, 34. Give thanks to the Lord for He is good. His steadfast love endures forever. I mean, and it really, you know, this is what our grateful, our loving Heavenly Father has done for His creation from the very beginning when 
he said, let there be light. I mean, even then he's giving us. I mean, imagine what that light comes from. I mean, we can we could go in a thousand different directions about how the cre- universe is created. I mean, you could you know you could ask about the Big Bang theory or this or that or the other. But the, the reality is, what Scripture is telling us is that it is God who gave us that light. It is God who sparked all creation with His powerful word. And if it weren't for the light, we would have nothing, right? Uh, you know, Pastor Johnson mentioned in his sermon at, at noontime. I mean, if you stop and think about it, it really is an amazing thing, this universe that we live in. And, and I tell our students uh, when I get the opportunity to, to, to play a little scientist, a little mad scientist in, in, in class sometimes, I, I get that opportunity. I said, you know, stop and think about how, how precise this idea, what an amazing architect God truly is. It's an, amaz- it's an amazing thing, this, this intricate creation. And I'm, you, you could talk about the human body, or you could talk about the universe. You know? The idea that, that, that the planet Earth is in just the right place. You know? Just the right place. A little bit, a little bit closer, you know, and we're a pork chop, right? Frying in a pan. A little bit farther away, and we're an ice cube. I mean, just a little bit. If it were a little bit this way, a little bit that way, right? It's amazing what God does with so much. And as we stop on this time, and we hear the scriptures, I, I kind of focused in on the, the Deuteronomy text. As I listen to what it is that, uh, that God has done for creation from the very beginning, it, I, it would be amazing. I suppose it could be very easy to, to get complacent, right? To, to think, you know, to, to let the day go by without giving thanks to God. It would be easy for that to happen. You know, we get so caught up in, in well, the things that, that, that Jesus is talking about in Matthew, right? Worrying about the clothes that we're going to wear, the food we're going to put on the table, all of those things. We, we get caught up in those things, Right? Because, you know, I mean, we, we get on, and, and, and what is it? You know, we don't want to be lazy, right? It, 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 we don't want to sit back and say, you know, it's just all going to come to us. But at some point, you know, our anxiousness about the things of this life really go beyond the, the merely needful into the, into the area of want. You know, learning the difference between wants and needs, Right? That becomes a challenge for us to figure that out, doesn't it? What is our want versus what our need is? So oftentimes, you know, we live in a pretty abundant place. We live in an abundant land. I mean, all those things that, that, uh, that uh, the writer of Deuteronomy there, of traditionally we understand Moses, says there, all those things we could say about the land that we live in today, couldn't we? I mean, there's a lot here. You know, we are living in a day in a land that overflows with milk and honey. You know, from an economics standpoint, we figure out real quick that we've got a lot of things other places don't. You know, you know we've got uh, a lot of blessings. And so it becomes easy to really be focused on not the, the things that we need, but the things that we want. The things that are are uh, are really not uh, what what uh, what it is that, that you know what we need, but what we want. So it would be easy to become complacent and forget exactly where all of this comes from. And I, and I think that's kind of in many ways where we are as a as a culture and a society. We have gotten to the place where we have forgotten many of us. Where this all comes from. So that's why it's important for us. You know, in, in reality, as, as Christians, as disciples of Jesus Christ, there shouldn't be one day of thanksgiving. Yeah, every day is a day of thanksgiving. You know, like it's the idea that we wake up every, you know, it should surprise us in many ways, but it doesn't. So it is easy to be complacent. And when we become complacent, there's another pitfall, right? There's another real pitfall that comes along with that complacency. 
And that pitfall is beginning to think that it is, in fact, our own hands that brought about all of these wonderful things. And so that complacency becomes deadly, not so much in the physical sense, but it becomes deadly in the physical, I mean, in the spiritual sense, that that complacency begins to chill our hearts, our love, our devotion to God and in His Son, Jesus Christ. So we, we could very easily fall into the trap of believing that all of this prosperity, all of this success is, is by our own hand. Right? We did this, right? It reminds me of the, there's a scene, I, I love Tom Hanks. There's very few movies Tom Hanks has ever done that, that I didn't like. But oddly enough, the one that I think, I, I use, I, I, this is weird, but I've used more sermon references from this movie. Uh, and it's the movie Castaway. Remember that movie? And there's a part in which, you know, you know, he's on the island and he's been on the island for a while, but then, you know, then he decides, you know, he's got to have fire. He's got to have fire. And so he builds this fire and he's very proud of himself. Very, very proud. And he just kind of said, look what I have made, this fire. And he you know, starts going into the version of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the, the doors. Come on, baby, light my fire. <laughs> and he's very proud of his ability. You know, I, I guess maybe he, you know, his character wasn't a Boy Scout. I don't know. Fire is supposed to be one of those easy things, right? But how easy is it for us to kind of, look what I have made. And as we stand in front, whether it's in a business uh, uh, area and in, in any aspect of our lives as a teacher, I can tell you, you know, when you see uh, you, you see a, a student who struggled and and, and and struggled and struggled and we, you finally found that thing that it that it took to get a concept or an idea and the kid gets it and you start, you know, beating your chest. Look what I did. Yeah, look what I did. Yeah, yeah you didn't do nothing. I have to remind myself of that. You didn't do nothing. You know, uh, it's easy as a you know as a pastor to to stand back there and 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 he, the, hear the prayer. Oh, yeah, pastor, it was a great sermon. It was a wonderful sermon. You know, and it's easy to get that big head, right? You could just feel the head just kind of swelling a little bit. But then you realize it's not you, pal. You know, it's not you. We are conduits of. God's love, God's grace, God's mercy, God's benevolence. And it flows from Him through us into the kingdom, into the world. So it's really God's hand. So that complacency stands as a potential barrier between us. It really, in many ways, I suppose that's kind of a, a form of self-righteousness. If you really want to stop and think about it. And that's something we're always at, 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 at war with. This idea that uh, we really don't need God, right? I mean, isn't that what Adam and Eve did in the, in the very beginning in the, in the, in the, in the, in the garden? You know, the, the, the tempter is there. He said, oh, you won't. You, you, you'll, you'll have wisdom. You'll be able to determine good and evil for yourself. Wow, you won't even need God. Who needs God, right? We don't need God. Yeah. There it is, right there. You know, it's like a, the, a, a, on on uh, uh, on Sunday, uh, I referenced the Book of Judges, and the last line from the Book of Judges goes like this: "In Israel, there was no king, and everybody determined what was right in their own eyes." And that's kind of that's self righteous, right? This is good. This is right. This is meat and right. This is I, I, I get to determine that, right? And that's a big challenge for us today. Even today, we don't we act as if we don't need God to help us, and we think very easily that all of these things comes from our own hands, from our own wit and wisdom, from our own ingenuity and creativity. Until we get to this day. Thanksgiving. And we stop and we take a moment. But again, it's the idea of, of as a disciple of Christ, we humble ourselves in the knowledge that none of this, 
comes from our hands. None of it. None of it. It's like the person who says, I'm a self-made person, right? You know, we like to think of ourselves in many ways as, a, as, as our, you know, we, we built ourselves from the ground up. You know, pick yourself up by your own bootstraps. That's the reality is not true. I mean, how, how many of us really truly ever get to the place that we get to in life without the, the help, the aid, the mentoring, the, 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 the assistance of another person, right? None of us gets to where we get in life. First and foremost, we don't get to that place in life if God is not in it. So we come together to give thanks because that is what it is for us to do. That's what we have been you know, created to do. We were created to love God and give Him thanks, the thanks that is due to Him for all that He has given us. So thanksgiving comes from a heart full of love. And we love because He first loved us. We have everything that we have because He gave it to us. And there's a really important aspect of all of this. And we talk about it a lot in liturgy. As we move to the table, I mean, there's, I mean, obviously the liturgy, how, we, how liturgy is done, and has been done really, in, in, you know, with some tweaking here and there, uh, the, pretty much the same liturgy we've done for 2,000 years. It's an effort at remembrance. I mean, that's what it is. I mean, if you don't remember something on a constant basis, right, you, you forget it. And the old phrase, as a, as a, as a student of history, uh, my undergrads in history, uh, we say oftentimes that people who forget history are doomed to repeat it. But that should not be so among the people of God. It should not be so. Because if you stop and think everything that, that worship is supposed to be about is remembering exactly what God has done for us. And so that's why it's important to come back on a weekly basis. I mean, a little plug here. I don't know. I'm a pastor. I'm supposed to think that way, right? That we we gather together on a on a Sunday, or or goodness goodness gracious, in the middle of the week. You know, earlier today, pastor was telling us uh, uh, that one of the the visitors um, came up and said, "Oh wow, you guys have services every Wednesday." And we'd like to say, "Yeah, sure, yeah, All right, but maybe maybe not, maybe not." The reality is, when people the people of God come together, it's about remember the calendar, the church calendar. Is about remembering. It's a flow of remembering. I mean, what is it that, that when, when, when God tells Moses and the people who are in Egypt, as he's preparing them for that journey to go, he's, they, they, they have a feast. You know, we meet, we eat, right? They have a feast. And, and he tells them to keep the feast every year. To remember what it was that God has done. Every year. So, and, and for us, every Sunday, we come together. Remembering is an important part. Because if we forget what it is that God has done, we're not offering the thanks and praise that He has given us. In fact, one of the words for the, what we do at the table, well, in many places you know, we, that use a lot more churchly language, it's called the meal of Holy Eucharist. The word Eucharist means he gave thanks. I mean, Jesus took. We think back to the stories, the feeding stories. Jesus took what little was there and he fed the crowd. You don't have to worry about it. Again, or Jesus reminding us, you don't have to worry about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, because God's got that taken care of. And we remember that because Jesus took a little kid's lunch pail. In essence, what we're talking about here. A little kid's lunch pail, a couple of loaves of bread and some fish, right? And he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave thanks. Just like he did on the night in which he was betrayed. And so we, as his people, gather together again, as it is meet and right for us to do. To remember what it is that God has done for us on a regular basis. And knowing what He has given us, our posture, our daily prayer is one of thanksgiving. So it is important for us to remember exactly what it is that God has done for us. 
There's a little phrase. Sometimes we, it's said in the liturgy. Sometimes it isn't. It depends on where you're at. I've been in churches that is done every Sunday. As often as you eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we remember the Lord's death until He comes. But it's not just His death that we remember. It's also His rising from the dead. The hope that He gives us. And so what is it that we, so we begin the, 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 the liturgy of the meal with? The great thanksgiving. We give thanks. And then we go into the salvation history of all that it is that God has done. And boy, I tell you what, if we, if we did the salvation history right, we'd be here an awful long time. So we shorten it down just a little bit. I'm, t- I'm just saying, I just want you to know, we're shortening it just a little bit here. All right? Understanding that it goes from, God's goodness goes from Adam and Eve in the garden to Noah and the flood to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob to his son Joseph in Egypt through Moses and Elijah and finally to his son Jesus. That is a remembrance of what God has done, is doing and will continue to do for his people. That is the great salvation story. And so we gather together as his people to repent for forgetting when he is the source. To hear the great gift of absolution which emanates from God's giving love. And we sing his praises. We hear the words of what he has done. And we share in the meal that feeds us. Because he knows exactly what it is. That we have need of. So we gather together again. With friends. With family. With brothers and sisters in Christ. Tomorrow we will feast on turkey. And dressing. And all the trimmings. And my mouth is watering just thinking about it. But tonight. We feast on the foretaste. Of the meal that is to come. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's take a moment to reflect on God's word and his will for our lives.